Well, good afternoon, good afternoon everybody. Uh, welcome back. Um, I'm glad to see so many people still here at, uh, at five o'clock. Um, I must admit, when I first saw the, uh, the schedule for the event over the two days, firstly I thought at five o'clock nobody's, nobody's going to ever want to see another PowerPoint slide again. And also, uh, I thought that if, if I'm scheduled to be on at five o'clock, then uh, we wouldn't start to six o'clock. So I'm very impressed by the way uh, Plaman and the team have kept everybody to time. Uh, exceptionally impressed by that. So uh, job well done. Okay, so in terms of uh, wrapping up uh, for, t for today um, and wrapping up the, certainly the, the presentations from Google that we have, um, what I've tried to do in this, in this uh, presentation is really to um, pull together a number of themes, a number of ideas, and, the, and some different data which hopefully will leave you with a clearer sense of where we believe, uh, where we believe the internet is with Google and the things that uh, we believe are important at the moment, particularly in the relation to e-commerce. So it's not a, a search, it's not a how to do search marketing presentation, it's a presentation which aims to step back a little bit and give an oversight in terms of uh, the, the type of things, the type of issues we believe are important. So I'm going to cover a little bit in terms of uh, where we are with internet in evolution, uh, look at putting a bit of detail behind uh, user activity, and then stepping back and saying, well, what is it that drives the search activity that we see online? I then want to come on and talk about uh, what we see is, is quite an uh, important uh, relationship between search and how brands are presented. And then I'd like to uh, start to finish off with um, notes from a, an economic slowdown, some things that we see have been happening over the last year in terms of the way that um, business has responded to a, a slower economy. And then a couple of th uh, final thoughts to uh, wrap up from there. Okay, so in terms of trying to put a little bit of sense around internet evolution, I just start with a little bit of uh, data here. Um, I'm sure you've seen variations on this type of data over the last uh, two days or so. But um, if we then, um, if we're working up from the bottom, really, in terms of the different types of categories of online usage that uh, we all as users demonstrate when we, when we go online, you can see really still in the relatively early days of the internet, 2003, the, the search for information and the use and communication, they were the two main things. That's where we spent our time. Um, E-commerce starting to grow, um, and the, so the sector's community and entertainment much lower in terms of the amount of time people would spend online per month doing this different type of activity. Fast forward uh, four years. Oops. Okay. There we go. Okay, fast forward four years, and we've, what we've seen is a, um, a slowdown in the rate of increase of information, um, also the consumption of information, a significant increase in the, the uh, use of the internet as a communication medium, and a st ongoing steady growth in, uh, in uh, e-commerce. But particularly really now between uh, this data point of 2007 and where we expect uh, things to be in 2012, what you can see very much is that we expect there to be a huge and ongoing growth in the whole entertainment and community sector. So entertainment, obviously, video and YouTube is very significant for us. Community, well, we all know Facebook and the, loc and the, uh, the competitors to Facebook uh, around the world. Um, what's uh, hopefully important to everybody here is, uh, as a business trying to sell online or a, an agency trying to work with your clients online is... Uh, the fact that e-commerce is relentlessly carrying on growing in terms of how users are spending their time online. If we put this into a timeline, um, we've all heard about Web, web 1.0 and so on. What I'd say is that uh, yeah, the early days, um, if we come back and we look at information communication, those were the days when we, we first arrived as Google, when we had Hotmail, when we had Yahoo, um, and MSN is one of the early communication tools. But very quickly, as uh, user numbers, which is the blue line, started to accelerate, we, we started really to see that huge, um, or the, the step change in um, not, people, not just people spending time on e-commerce, but in terms of people really spending money with e-commerce. And that was the time where brands, which I think everybody would be familiar with, e-commerce, Amazon, eBay, and many others, that's when they really started to grow. And what we see now in terms of uh, overall level, um, user numbers have continued carrying on on a global level, approximately 1.6 uh, billion people now. Um, so a, a fairly linear increase in the number of users online, but in uh, what we call the web uh, 3.0 category, where the, the label isn't so much important, but what is important is that there's this whole evolution of uh, community and entertainment uh, tools, which uh, we, we didn't really have prior to uh, 2004, 2005. Of course, it's very difficult to say when does communication stop and when does community start. Um, and, and as you know, tools such as Facebook are, are used for many different purposes. 
But I think as, as we go through this, the important thing to understand is from your, from your business point of view or from your, your client's point of view, are you, are you still at that stage in terms of your own online web presence? Is your, is your presence very much, is your site about conveying information? Is it really still brochureware for, for your products and services? Or have you very much moved on to that, that fully transactional stage? And it's surprising, you know, even, um, even in what you'd think to be many of the developed markets, UK, Germany, Scandinavia, and so on, how many, uh, how many companies still don't have a fully transactional website? Or you know, are you at the stage of business 3.0 where your internet is far more than just a sales tool? It's, uh, it's very much a tool to engage with customers across uh, many different levels. My focus would be to say that you know, what, if you're not at business 2.0, then you need to get there as you need to invest and um, improve your offering to get there as soon as possible because there's money to be had. In terms of where you go then, once you have a fully functioning sales channel, that's a more difficult and complex question. Okay, so a little bit more detail now in terms of, we, we, we've said a bit of the, the growth of evolution in context. Let's have a li li little bit of a look more at uh, specific user activity when it comes to uh, e-commerce. Okay, well firstly we know, and we would say that coming from Google, search is a universal consumer activity. To be more specific about it, um, data from the UK, but it applies very much across other markets as well, that 81% of people on average, variations by market, but uh, use the, you know, the, web, the a search engine as the front door to enter websites. And this is very true not just across markets, but it's also true across different sectors of the economy as well. So even with quite large considered purchases, such as, uh, such as an auto purchase, a car purchase, um, he wouldn't be buying one of those Citroens nowadays, but uh, you know, it, at, at that level, 80% of uh, people are now, certainly again, it's data from the UK, are starting their search for the product online. So the internet is very much the starting point, the starting point and search within that is, is the door to the internet. But the, the other thing is that search behavior, the search behavior that we see, it's also personal to the user, obviously, and it's iterative. So the user will search, they'll find some, more, some information out, and then they'll come back and they'll do another search based on what they learned on the previous search. And you know, so what we're dealing with when, when we're working as, as Google and when we work with our clients, we, we're working with general overall patterns, but also the reality is that the, the behavior that you see and visitors that come to your site, it's an aggregate of all those individual behaviors from individual users. To try and make a little bit, I mean, to just try and make this a slightly more practical uh, example, what we've done here, we, we did a lot of work um, about uh, 12, 18 months ago in terms of looking at purchases online and then working backwards from those purchases to understand the user behavior in the period prior to the purchase itself. This is a, a travel industry example. There are, industry, there are examples um, from many other fields as well, but uh, it's getting late and we all want to see a picture of a beach. So um, what we have is a timeline here. Um, but what I'd want you to bring out from this is that this is a customer who, based, th this is an example timeline of a genuine customer who made a purchase for a travel product. In this case, actually, it was a, it was a purchase to, for a, a holiday in Cyprus. But they spent 33 days between their first travel-related search and their purchase um, investigating, researching that holiday. They made 11 searches in this case, and they made 28 site visits. And the, the brand that they chose was a, was a tour, oper tour operator brand called uh, First Choice, quite active, uh, bringing a lot of customers to the, to the Black Sea, for example, here in uh, Bulgaria. But what you can see here is that over that 33-day uh, that period, they actually made seven visits to that customer site before they made the final purchase. And so what we see is that it's not a, a search, visit your site, maybe come back a second time and purchase. Certainly with a more complex uh, product, there's an extended timeline, an extended number of searches, an extended number of site visits before the customer makes the purchase itself. That's a travel example. Uh, this is, um, probably the slide doesn't come out so clearly, but th this is an example of a similar pattern for people purchasing a lower ticket item, in this case, a mobile phone. And what I really wanted to, to highlight here is that uh, of the, the average research period for, for these mobile phone purchases was 27 days. So again, close to that four week, one month period. And what's interesting as well from a tracking point of view, and I'd also encourage you to, you know, when you go back and you look at your sites and your client sites and look at the tracking, is the sheer amount of transactions that take place maybe up to 30 days after the initial search and site purchase. So in, in this example, in the study that we did, 
42% of sales actually took place after 30 days after the initial search for the product. So ex again, extended period of time. And in this case, we found that uh, there were an average for mobile phone purchases of 8.5 searches prior to conversion. Moving back to, uh, moving back to travel customers, what we see here is that we saw a figure of 8.5 searches with, uh, with mobile phones. With travel, it's a, more, it's a more involved purchase, it's a bigger ticket purchase. So we, as, you'd see, as you'd expect, we see a slightly higher number. Though interestingly, not a significantly longer average period of time. In this case, in the study that we did, 29 days. So what I'd, what I'd hope that you take away with in terms of customer search and purchase behavior from what we see from all the data that we see is that we're really talking about a four week period between the customer's initial search and their purchase and we're talking about maybe eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 searches relevant in the product category that is relevant to the product they're purchasing. And the thing is that obviously don't forget that as a, uh, as a merchant as you're trying to sell your product online, the, the, the customer is not just searching for that particular product, they're doing all sorts of other things online and maybe purchasing other products in other categories too. So when, when, you, when you get the customer, to, on those times when you do get the customer to your site, you have to work very hard to make sure that they get the information that, you need, that, that they need and that you work as hard as possible to, to drive the conversion of the visit um, you know, as early as you can do within the research uh, process itself. Okay, so we've seen the extended period of time across which users search before they make a purchase. Um, in other trends that we see, and again, this is quite consistent across uh, sectors, is really, and it always surprises me to see, is really when buyers start their research process, they are um, incredibly undecided as to the brand, the, actual, the brand or the actual product within the brand that they plan to uh, purchase. These are, these are, again, some data from uh, uh, the auto industry car example. Um, and what we find is that you know, the customer knows that they want to buy a car, but over half of them, 52%, they, they've, they've un they're undecided on, the, let's say, the type of car. Do they want a, a saloon car, uh, an, est an estate car, a sports wagon, a, uh, a sports car itself? So they, they're, not even, they're not even clear on the broad uh, sports category, and they're certainly not clear, up nearly close to one third are not clear on the make do they want a, we all want a Ferrari, but uh, uh, they're not clear on the, the make of the car. And then close to 70%, 69% are not clear, um, they're, or they're certainly undecided in terms of the, the actual uh, car and model that they want to purchase. So very high numbers of, cust a very high level, I guess, of undecidedness and um, not, not unpreparedness, but uh, undecidedness as to what it is that they actually want to purchase. Coming back to a travel example here, um, we asked, uh, we, we did research which asked questions for, from the user in terms of when you wanted to, in this case, to research, make a, a flight purchase, what are the things that were, um, that were true or, or, let's say, what did you just made your mind up about before you wanted to uh, make the purchase? Now, as you'd expect, 75% uh, of the top, you know, they knew where they wanted to go. Business travelers knew where they wanted to go. Leisure travelers were open as to where they could be suggested to go. But what was interesting from a, an airline point of view is that only 8% of the customers, a tiny minority of the customers, had not decided which product, which airline, which brand they wanted to fly with. So what I'd be keen to, uh, to stress from this is that users are uh, searching actively. Um, you, have many you have many opportunities to communicate with them as they search, but, bear in, but don't, don't expect them to be clear at the don't expect them to be clear at the start that they know which brand or which product they want to buy. So you have repeated opportunities to try and persuade them to come to your site or to your client's site. Search also, and what's very, um, another key really, another key aspect of search is that search is about, for many users, it's about discovery as well. So in this case, we asked, uh, we asked car manufacturers what it is that, uh, what are the types of things that search allowed them to do? And I flagged up the top here in green. One of them was discovering new brands, and another dis dis discovering new models. So you can't obviously search for something you don't know about. Throughout the research process, customers start to discover things obviously they didn't know before, and that hopefully is, uh, is your product and your brand further down the line. So just to, to wrap up uh, this section here in terms of customer search behavior, what you can see, 
what I'd, what I'd pull out here is even for such a major ticket item, 50 f in terms of the final purchase of the brand, compared to what was considered the most likely brand that the customer would purchase when they started their research, 55%, uh, so just over half of the buyers had physically switched the brand that they, in terms of when they started searching and the purchase they made, 55% had switched the brand um, that they had in their mind. So there's a great opportunity here online to, to, commun to reach out to customers and persuade them that what you have to offer is, is, is the best and most suitable to their needs. Okay, so we talked a lot about search and search behavior and the extended period of time that it takes uh, place. But let's, um, let's uh, step back a little bit and try and understand well, what, is it, what is it that drives search behavior? I mean, we, um, we're a business that's heavily reliant on search, so we're very glad for all the activity that takes place that brings, people, brings customers to the computer or the increasingly now the mobile phone and drive search. And probably the, um, the most, I mean, it, in a way it's, in some ways it's surprising, in other, in other ways it's, it's completely obvious that all the different touch points drive online search. So when the, when the consumer is coming to the computer to make the search, they have been influenced by many, many things before they, they, they sit down at the PC. And particularly, I mean, um, so what I've done here is I've pulled out, uh, I'm not sure how clearly that you can see this, but uh, this is a, and I, I've extracted um, just a screenshot from uh, Google Insights, which is our publicly available tool to understand search patterns. Um, and what we have here is a particular search trend um, running through 2006 through to uh, September 2009. And you can see for this search trend, there was no activity until maybe April or May this year. Does anybody have an idea of what, what this search represented, what people were searching for? Any ideas or any guesses? Uh, Say again? Virus? Virus? Uh, computer virus? Um, it's a good idea. The good suggestion? Um, no, good guess. This is, it's very simple. This is Web IT in Bulgaria. These are, the, these are, these are users searching for, for this conference in this country. And you can see here, that's the, um, on one side, that's the impact of all the, offline, all the offline and also online media that was taking place, and then that is influencing search behavior. And if you want to understand the search behavior, I can't stress enough, try and become as familiar with uh, Google Insights as you can do, because that will give you a very good understanding about the type of behavior that's taking place in your market or your, or your client's market. So to try and put some, some numbers on this, um, you know, always whether the percentage, obviously percentage, the actual percentages will vary from study to study to study. But uh, what we see here is that two-thirds of uh, you know, search users, um, two-thirds two, two of users who come to us or to other search engines are directly influenced by an offline channel. We have obviously the different channels here, pr TV, print, billboard, radio, word of mouth from uh, friends and relations and so on. But what I would say is that the, what, what I'd be keen to stress from this is that when... Um, when you're making marketing plans and you're running offline marketing activity particularly, then make sure that you're, what you're doing online in terms of what you're doing online with search is matching what you're doing offline. If you don't, if you don't put the two together, your online and your offline activity, then you'll be missing an opportunity in terms of uh, the, the business that you can bring to, um, for yourselves. Of course, uh, online, online display activity um, with us and with, uh, with other companies drive search behavior as well. I, I won't dwell on this. What I'd say, though, is that in terms of uh, the figure to remember is that uh, in terms of display advertising driving search activity and display advertising driving clicks from those actual ads, it's very much the same sort of order of magnitude in terms of when, when you see a, a display ad, they're just as likely to make a subsequent search for the brand as they are actually to click on the link at that particular time itself. Okay, so that's um, very much looking in terms of who, uh, what, it, what was driving search activity, and we, we look, then looked previously at how users have been searching. What I wanted to do was turn it around the other way and try and make some sort of relationship between what users see when they search and what they think about the brands that are represented or not represented in the search results. Okay, so what's very clear, and um, we understand this very clearly, and uh, marketers are understanding this more and more, is that the search results, is in terms of obviously just driving direct traffic, and whether a customer clicks on, on your ad, whether it's, a, sorry, whether it's a paid ad or whether it's a natural listing, what they see will dramatically influence their perception of the, of the brand's offering. 
to put that in context, uh, I'm not sure, do, do you have the Interflora brand here in, in Bulgaria? I presume, uh, presume so. Interflora, it's a, it's a um, international flower delivery service. Um, what, uh, what we have here, I'm not sure whether we can see, um, see that, but a search, uh, a search has been made for um, Interflora. Sorry, can you press this, can you press escape on the, uh, thank you. Okay, so what, what you see there is that Interflora, as a brand, they've recognized the importance. Not only they've got a first, they've got a natural listing, a, 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 their site is optimized, so when people find, look for the site, we list it first of all. They also serve up an ad at the top of the screen there. So you can see that they very much, in the customer's mind, they dominate, uh, they dominate the screen um, for, for, inter, for their brand when the customer searches for their brand. It's not just that they, they will get incremental traffic on the, on the basis of doing that, but there's, there will also be positive attributes in terms of the way that the customer thinks about that brand in the future, and not just now at that particular point. So it's very, it's very true to say that it is, you, are judged, you are judged by your page rank. Um, many studies show that across multiple markets. And what, what we, in terms of particular data points that we have here, we can see that 71% uh, of users expect the leading brands to be, on, when they're making a relevant search, they expect, the, they expect leading brands to be there at the top of the search returns. And 36% um, of users Link, link the placement to and um, where they, uh, the customer is placed on the screen to the actual overall prominence of the customer within the market itself. So it's not just about driving traffic here and now, it's about using search marketing where you're not, pay, you know, you're not paying for the impression, you're only paying for the click to also positively influence the, the way the customer sees your brand. Just a, a, a little bit more data which, which looks at this. Um, we, we've done um, some research which has been aggregated across many different sectors, many different verticals. Um, and if we look at different brand metrics, uh, do, if, if we look on the left-hand side, what's the uplift in terms of do the brand affinity, do customers like your brand? Well, there's a, an 18% uplift if customers are regularly seeing your brand in the search results. A 14% up, uh, uptick, uplift in terms of would the customer buy the brand? And what's most marked in terms of brand recall is, in, in terms of this case, prompted brand recall, is repeated exposure within the search results very much drives the, uh, dri drives the recall of the brand in the customer's mind, which hopefully then in turn will drive them to search for your brand directly when they come back for their next search. Okay, so uh, relation, that was a, a quick overview of the relationship between search and brands. What I wanted to do now really to um, the second part of the presentation is to just to pull out some points and some ideas that are very specific to, I guess, the last 12 months that we've had in terms of a, a slowdown in the, the global economy and hopefully now coming out the other side of that. Before, before I go into some specific points, well, one thing that I wanted to to stress is that over, this, over the last 12 months, over the, the, the economic slowdown that we've seen, users never stop searching. And in fact, if we look at, um, this is data from Comscore, um, 40, there were 41% 41, 41 more searches in July this year versus July last year. So customers were, were increasingly coming online to search. I mean, huge figures, whether it's 100, mil 100 billion, 113 billion searches globally, these are very, very big figures. What I aim to focus on is 40, 41% increase. In Europe alone, that figure is 36, was 36 billion searches in July, so over a billion searches per day uh, in Europe. Whether, whether customers found, or whether people found uh, happiness on Google, I'm not sure. Uh, we hope so at least some of the time. Okay, um, and ag again, another specific uh, data point. Um, what we have here, what I've just tried to show you specifically, what's the, what's the pattern been in uh, Bulgaria itself? These are to total searches on Google across all categories by month since 2007. And what you can see here is that we've had a, a steady evolution. Um, th uh, th and if we were to extend backwards, you'd, see, you'd obviously see that line trending down backwards as well. But uh, if we took, let's say, August this year and August last year, 52% more searches on Google within this market. And I think it was 52% in uh, July as well, 54% in August. So a very consistent trend. Despite the slowdown, customers are searching online increasingly. So what, what, what did we learn? You know, what have we learned from, from the slowdown so far? Well, the, I mean, the first thing I'd say is that, you know, 
as, as we saw, customers were still searching, and often they were searching in increasing numbers because they were looking to trade their own time for, um, in terms of their own time searching, for money that they would save subsequently down the line. And there have been some very successful initiatives, particularly in the, in the US, which looked at uh, looked, you know, trying to give consumers a very good reason to buy you know, right now or this week or this month rather than deferring the purchase. Um, in, in, in the, we've had it in the US, we've had it similar in the, in the UK, but also other markets in terms of, for example, incentivizing car purchase. Um, with, uh, with JetBlue in the US, which is a low-cost airline, they, had a, they, they, ran, they ran a promotion which was basically for a, uh, a short period of time, you could buy an air pass. It was $600, so it was not a cheap purchase, where you could then, try, you could then travel on JetBlue as much as you liked on their network within one month. Very clear reasons to drive consumers to make their purchase now, tactical offers to drive their purchase now rather than defer that purchase. So cons consumers have continued to buy. What we've also seen is that shopping, and this, this is, again, data from the US, which is relating to shopping, which is categorized as holiday period. And by that, we mean Thanksgiving and, and Christmas in, in the US. And what's very clear is that customers are, are they're starting to search earlier. And at the same time, uh, in the slowdown, they also, not only are they starting to search earlier, but they're also carrying on to search right up to the, let's say, to the holiday period itself in a far more dramatic fashion than they did uh, last year. So let's say if you took the week before Christmas um, in the US last year, which is when, you know, th that was a time of a fairly much, you know, an economic meltdown, and compared that with the week before Christmas in 2007, there was a 98% increase in e-commerce in those few days before Christmas. So customers were, you know, they were still wanting to buy. Um, they were shopping, they were searching earlier, maybe starting their purchasing, purchasing earlier, being very attuned to value and very sensitive to a uh, promotion that would drive their purchase there and then. What, another thing really to, that, um, and this is slightly surprising I think when we think of what we've seen from a, a global slowdown, is that uh, even, even in times of a, a slowing economy, what the, the choices and the, that consumers and customers have online have continued to grow. So. Um, data that shows, for example, retailers in the U.S., 7% um, more retailers in the U.S. Uh, in, the, in September 2009, so last month, in comparison to September 2008. So even though the market has got tougher, there are also more businesses online, more businesses extending their product offerings online to compete for those customers. So just because there's a slowdown, it hasn't meant that uh, you know, the, the number of businesses that have fallen away to match the reduction in uh, the reduction in overall customer demand. With, let's say, in, in certain sectors such as if we take airlines, it's easy, you can, you can take airlines out of service, but when it comes to, for example, with manufacturing, um, with stores that for uh, retailing where you have your stores, you have to open them every day, it's, uh, it's harder to wind down the capacity. So consumer, you know, from a, a slowdown, if you've got, if you, as a consumer, if you've got money in your pocket, you've still been given a lot of choice. And, he, and uh, another point, the fourth point, and the five points I want to make in the section is that, again, the, the theme, again, through the slowdown period, is that the, there has been a relentless trend to online, which has dwarfed the actual slowdown from the economy point of view as well. So what we see on the, on the left-hand side, highlighted in blue, four different uh, retail categories, whether it's department stores, home improvement, consumer electronics, home furnishings, and so on. And we look at the number of conversions, the amount of sales that have been driven by Google-related activities. This is third-party data here. Then we see whether it's 50%, 100%, 150%, significant increase still in online conversions. We trade that off on the, the right-hand side there with overall retail sales year on year. And we can see here uh, high single figures, low double fig figures in terms of reduction. So underlying the... Uh, Underlying the slowdown is a relentless wave to online, which is, which is still, I mean, it's good news for us, has still been dwarfing the, uh, uh, the, the lack of economic confidence itself. And in fact, what, what's interesting is that this is a, um, Terry Lundgren, who runs the, the Macy's uh, chain in the US, uh, he said uh, two weeks ago, he was very clear in terms of, for every dollar that he spends online, he, he believes, or they believe internally within their stores, that they generate $5.77 in their stores. So what we're seeing, too, is that uh, not only is, is the search activity driving business online, but it's also still driving consumers into stores, even at a tougher time of the, uh, the economic cycle. 
The final point uh, I'd like to make in this section before uh, wrapping up the presentation itself is to say that uh, no, I mean, a lot of probably what you've heard about over the, the last few days has been very focused on bringing visitors into your websites. How do you acquire traffic? How do you get the right traffic for, the, uh, for your products? It's the thing that is, I mean, it's, it's a truism, and I'm, I'm sure you'll know it, but it's, it's easier to, you know, you can double your profits by doubling the conversion rate on your site. It's easier to do that than doubling your traffic. Doubling your traffic is more expensive. Um, your, you know, your budget is going out there and being spread more thinly. So... Some of, you know, some of the, the workshops and so on, I think, from ourselves and from other people have been very focused on how can you increase your conversion. And I, I would say that in times of an economic slowdown, really think very hard about how you can really maximize the, the business from every visitor that comes into your, your website itself. To take a, uh, if we were to take a non-commercial uh, non example here, just to... Uh, Appreciate we're getting, you've seen a lot of slides, we're getting to the, uh, the end of the day here. Just, just really to amplify the importance of making sure your, site, your sites are put together properly and that you, you try variations and you test where you have the resources to do so. Um, what I've done here is I've extracted some data from the, the Barack Obama campaigns, election campaigns last year. And let's say if we take uh, the US as an example, it's, it's true in many countries, Raising funds for your political campaigns is what drives the success or otherwise of your campaigns. Um, the Obama campaign particularly was very, very aggressive and very forward-thinking in terms of using online, and not just using online, but using online well and intelligently to make, to make the most of what that channel had to offer. So what they did was, in, in many of the things that they did, and I'd advocate for, the same, for you to do the same in, uh, with, your bus with your businesses or your clients' businesses, is that they, they tested many different types of uh, landing pages for, or specific parts of their site where they drove user traffic to, and they also tested within their pages on their site many different variations of uh, buttons and so on in terms of the call to action for the consumer. So on the left-hand side here, we've got three particular landing pages on a, on a, a fundraising site. On the right-hand side, we've got uh, four different buttons. Can anybody guess what, uh, la what landing page on the left-hand side there was most effective? Any thoughts? Any ideas? So the second one, the bottom left. Bottom right. Okay, bottom right. Great. Okay. And which, bu which button? Sign up, sign up. None more? Okay, well, in this case, uh, the ones that were the most successful, so you're right, it was the, the family scene was, by, was significantly more effective in terms of com when combined with the button which said, in this case, learning more, um, in, in terms of really driving a significant uptick in uh, fundraising that subsequently resulted. It was an improvement of close to 33% on the initial launch of, the, of, this particular act, of this particular activity on, the, on this particular site. So in a, whether it's in a, a purely commercial setting or in a political setting or whatever the setting would be, I would, I would just, the point that I would like to stress is experiment, um, trial different things, and the tools are out there now on the internet from ourselves and from other people to learn, to learn by doing, and then to make your activity more effective itself. Okay, so a couple of final thoughts. Um, the next... Uh, really to, to wrap up and to say, well, and this really follows for those that were in uh, on the, the panel discussion that, uh, that took place yesterday, and we had the, the conversation in terms of is, is, marketing, is marketing more digital or is it not? I mean, and the, the chat from IAB really stressed that uh, uh, marketing is becoming digital-centric. I'd just really like to reinforce that point and also really to, also to stress that search is very much at the start of the consumer process, and it's integral to the whole decision process now, increasingly. So when you make your planning, when you, when you run your planning for your business, and you plan the media and you promote your business, just make sure that search is in, in, as integral to those plans as it is to the consumer itself. Don't get left behind by the consumer. And to come back to the uh, another just point I wanted to make, in terms of uh, experimenting and measurement, um, Particularly in, in tougher times, you have to do that more and more. However, as a as a consumer, as a as a business, don't be uh, don't don't also be afraid. I guess in trialing things, whether they work or whether they don't work. This is a uh, a shot here from a campaign that ran very recently in London. So it ran last month in London. Uh, maybe you've had similar things here in uh, Bulgaria. I'm, I'm 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 not sure, but it was the first time I'd seen them in this in London, where this was a campaign. So not an online campaign, but. Uh, 
what happened was that uh, cameras were set at the, at the roadside um, by, in this case, by Castrol, the uh, motor oil uh, manufacturer, and they would take a, uh, they would video the, the, dri the, the driver's number plate, and then further down the, line, further down the road, the, uh, the driver would see a billboard with the, their number plate uh, placed up there, and then what, in the meantime, in those few seconds between uh, the video taking the shot of the number plate, the driver getting towards the billboard, uh, Castrol would have, will have uh, looked at the, the, the licensing authority database, worked out what vehicle it was, and then shown an ad specifically for that number plate saying this is the product that you need from us. So that's how far it's possible to take customization. In this case, um, and I just wanted to highlight that it's possible to take it too far. There was a, there was a huge outcry on, on the back of this. That this was taking invasion of personal data and privacy too far. The campaign was live for four days. The public outcry switched the campaign off. But it, all, I, all I'm saying here with this point is that try and be inventive and creative in terms of the ideas that you have to learn more about your customers and to use that information to, to reach them. There's a great quote I think I wanted to wrap up from uh, Thomas Edison, the inventor of the light bulb, and it's, and it's, it's truer today than it, I think it's ever been, that to have a great idea, you have to have lots of them. Some of them work and some of them won't. Well, I hope you've had uh, lots of ideas through the course of the two days and hopefully some ideas from the presentation today. So uh, I'd like to say thanks very much at that point uh, and invite any questions and I'll try and answer the questions that you have. So thanks very much. Thanks. Uh, you said that 55% uh, of uh, car buyers switch the brand. Uh, does this figure apply to other industries like cosmetics, electronics, and so on? Um, yes. Yeah, so we, we have a range. Of, we have a range of studies which show that um, when when customers uh, when customers starting the, the search process that they are they are either not clear at all. And the product, they, you know, they, in, in one case, maybe they don't know very much about the product category itself, and therefore their, the research, their search is purely about discovery itself. In others, let's say, I think the, I think the figures for auto are, let's say, people have 3.5 different brands in their mind, but they'll have one brand that is most, you know, that is uppermost in their mind when they start. Um, in, I, I, I don't have specific um, figures for the cosmetic industry, but I, I wouldn't want. Uh, I would, I, I would want to make. I would want to. I think clearly state the fact that j customers are starting the search process with a lot that's still up in the air, and there's a lot of opportunity over an extended period of time to keep on putting your message in front of them. How the, how the exact figures vary by industry. Um, they would. Uh, I mean, let's say some of the smaller ticket purchases, maybe where there's resu reduced customer choice, um, and you know, repeat levels of purchase, then. You know, its customers will have a clearer idea in their mind. Um, where it's a less frequent purchase, you could argue that uh, they, they're prepared to spread the net wider. Thank you. The, the lady at the front here, thanks. Uh, well, you said that 67% uh, of the online searches came from offline channel. Uh, does this mean that regarding the phase that everything goes digital, that the biggest investment in advertising still stays in offline channel and your expectation for this percent changes for the future? Sure. Um, I, I mean, that, that's a very, a very good point. I mean, at, at, at Google, we, we've never said that, you know, on, that offline activity will go away or, or should go away. What, we want to, what we're keen to stress is the relationship between the media that customers are exposed to offline, you saw that with the web, the WebIt example, and what they then do online. Um, we'd, you know, we would only expect that, I guess, that degree of relationship and responsiveness to increase over, um, over time, and whether it's become 67, so, um, so whether it's 67% or drops to 60% or goes up to 70% doesn't, doesn't really matter, but I'd w we'd want to say, you know, don't under, you know, you're spending money offline, make sure that the customers can find, when they go online, they can find what you're offering. Otherwise, you're losing money. Gentleman over there, thanks. Sorry, the, gen the gentleman uh, at the back there on the left. Thank you. Sorry. 
Thank you. Uh, I'm Konstantin Mikhailov from uh, uh, Shopping Comparison site Pazarui.com. I'd like to ask you uh, in relation to one of the slides with uh, stating that uh, in, uh, Internet w would not be uh, a good source of information to, uh, in, in the future related to, to, to the past. So the, uh, an, an in increasement in, in information uh, uh, role will not be that great. How, how can you uh, uh, interpret this? Sorry, I did need, so the, the question that that's how do you inter interpret the, um, the smaller uh, role of uh, in, uh, information uh, uh, giving of internet uh, in the future? Okay, sorry, so, so the, the slide right at the start in terms of TAL. Okay, so what, that, um, what those slides were showing, it, it was um, there was the amount of time users spent online doing a particular type of activity. So it wasn't that they, they were spending less time looking for information, it was just that in terms of how they spent their total time online, the way that it broke down, the biggest growth that we expect to see over the, between, let's say, between now and over the next three years will be very much on the, you know, the community and the entertainment side. But, under, but users are still, um, we, you know, they're still looking for information in ever greater numbers. It's just that there's now a lot more things you can do on the internet now, and you will be able to do two, three years from now than you could do, let's say, in 2003 or the year 2000 or 1998. Does, does that answer your question? Okay, thanks. thanks. Hello, uh, I would like to ask, uh, can you transform the, the data about the high level of undecidedness to the services sector? Um, is, it, is it similar to the shopping? I, d I mean, specifically, um, I, s I suppose if you say that a I guess you'd have to distinguish between the business-to-business -business environment and the, the business-to-consumer environment. But in terms of the studies that we've seen, whether you're actually buying a physical product, something that's going to be shipped to your door, or buying a service that you'll, um, you'll experience at some point in the future, then uh, it's, it's certainly very true. I mean, I think if you, if, you take, if you take the sectors that grew very early on in terms of e-commerce, I mean, was, I mean, obviously products with the retail sector and the consumer electronics sector, but also to, in terms of services for finance and travel, and very high levels of research and subsequent purchase of a service online. So definitely in terms of what's true for those sectors, whether they're services or products, is um, in terms of undecidedness and, and switch and so on, is true. Thanks. I know. Hello. Oh, uh, this year we saw Wolfram Alpha, a search engine, come out, and we saw Bing coming out. Um, why should we use Google instead of Bing, and how, what is Google doing to uh, keep Bing number one search engine in the world? Okay. Um, well, uh, okay. Um, very fair question. I mean, can I ask you? The, can you answer that first question, and I'll answer the second one. <laughs> so uh, seriously. Well, I mean, and also like uh, Microsoft spent. A hundred million dollars uh, marketing in the U.S. Uh, sure. Is Google doing anything to market in the U.S. in Europe? Okay. Um, no, I mean, it's, 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 I, mean I, I don't mean to make light of the question. It's, it's a very fair question. I mean, we I guess what we there's. I, mean, I think Google is the the most un, uncomplacent company that I, I've worked with. The um, you know, in answer to your question, why? Why should people keep on searching with Google? I mean, there's, there's no, we don't have any right for those people to keep on searching with Google. So, um, you know, every day when the user switches their PC on, <coughs> excuse me, um, we, you know, we need to, to do what we can to make the search experience as, as good as possible so that they will, well, they will hopefully stay with us rather than try, you know, or, or, or repeatedly use a search engine from, a, from, a, from another company. So, I mean, in terms of how we're addressing that, I mean, we don't, we, we tend to, I mean, our investment focuses on, you know, has been primarily on our product. And, you know, what you don't see behind the scenes with Google and what we often don't see within Google internally itself is the sheer amount of ongoing investment on imp the improvement of, of search. And at any one point, there will be, you know, hundreds if not thousands of individual initiatives going on that will incrementally or sometimes at a step change improve the, the search experience. So there's, there's no degree of complacency, but why, to answer your question, why should people keep using us? There's no reason why they should. We have to prove ourselves each day. Hello. Uh, this is somehow uh, connected to the, the previous question. 
Uh, you didn't mention anything about Google Squared, and that's a different way of looking into the search results and a different way of looking into the uh, advertisement at all. So I would like to know, like, um, do you plan at all of developing it, or it was just a trial and sure, I mean, uh, it's, it's not really productive? Uh, so, I mean, so, so Google Squared, for those that, that, that don't know, is a way of is an alternative way of, of um, showing search results in particular categories. Um, so, what would, we're, we're always you know, we're always again experimenting in terms of what we show when the user searches for something, and always trying to understand what it is most relevant to what they're searching for. And Google Squared was one, is one of those initiatives. There are a number of other initiatives that uh, that are taking place all the time. I mean, what we we very much have a history, I guess, of experimenting. You know, we experiment internally with products, and then we experiment I I externally. And as, you know, we're, we're very lucky in the terms of we have the user volumes where we can learn very quickly whether something enhances the experience of the user or if it doesn't. And if it enhances the, the user experience, it's if it doesn't, then, then it's, you know, it's downgraded or, or removed at some point. Um, in terms of, um, I, mean, I, I, I don't work within the search quality team, so I can't answer specifically on, on Google Squared, but um, I think you can assume if you keep on seeing it and you see it in greater profile, then it, it's working. If you don't, then it's not. Gentlemen, thanks. Uh, you said that uh, people, uh, actually companies, uh, who are having some of the top brands are com having higher conversion rate if they are listed in the top listings, top web rankings. Uh, what would you recommend for smaller companies uh, to do in order to prevent that? Sure. So, sorry. So, so I probably okay. Let me uh, figure it out. Uh, let's say we have the gambling business in the UK. Okay. The large players are using uh, large search engine optimization tactics schemes of a large scale to be listed on top. How can a smaller player get listed over there? Sure. I mean, it's uh, in, in, in terms of. It's, yeah, there's always a, b a balance between um, you know, wh which ads that we show at a particular point. Um, what, uh, what I would say is that, I mean, just, just firstly on, on the first point, the, sorry, the, I probably wasn't very clear with the, the data, but what we were, that data didn't relate to necessarily improved conversion, it, it related to perception of the brand in the customer's mind. But particularly in terms of responding to the question, you know, how do, as a smaller player, do you become, um, and can, do you get yourself listed alongside the bigger players? And what I'd say, I mean, what you've, if you say that where you appear in the page search engine ranking, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a product of the, um, really the relevance of your ad and the, the bid that you're prepared to pay, you're not going to be able to be prepared to outbid, you know, you, you're not going to be able to outbid the big guys. So what you have to do is to really work very hard to make your, um, to make the ads that you have relevant, explicitly relevant to the exact user, to, to the exact search the, the user is making. I mean, a, as an example, we've had, uh, you know, in, this, in, uh, in the travel example, booking agent, you know, online travel agencies that have grown from a very small base to become very, you know, very powerful players. And they've done so by doing uh, search marketing based very tightly tailored um, niche by niche to what the user is looking for. So they would manage keywords, they would manage campaigns with keywords with tens of millions of keywords. And what they, what they would do is they would develop a very, very high relevance between individual searches, their ad, and then our, our system would learn that for that search, the customer would click on their ad more often than not. And then for a, a certain level of bid, they would then come higher up in the rankings. So I think as a smaller player, you can really focus on relevance and tailoring to ser searches at as a s uh, specific level as, as possible, because you won't be able to outbid the guys um, unless you're then earning a lot more money subsequently from the business that is transacted on the, the site itself. Okay. So, so the, uh, the gentleman right at the back, thanks. Hi, my question is about real-time search, uh, which I believe is getting pretty hot with uh, Twitter and now Facebook. Uh, what, what plans does Google have to be competitive in real-time search? Uh, how do you monetize real-time search by encouraging more advertisers to 
uh, respond more qu quickly with, with ads uh, as, as real-time searches become more and more, uh, take more and more share away from uh, traditional search. Sure, I mean, I, I think uh, it's, uh, it's early days for real-time search still. Um, I think we and other people are trying to learn how to do it well. Um, you know, as, I mean, in relation to one of the earlier questions, real-time search or searching of information that has just literally been posted on the internet very recently um, prevents, you know, pr presents technical challenges that we and our engineers will be trying to solve as much as anybody else. Um, it, you know, it's, 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 we, we've also been through similar phases, for example, with video search. And if you take YouTube now, YouTube is the second largest search engine in the world in terms of as a destination where searches take place, but a whole different range of technical problems. So um, how we're trying to, we'll, we'll try to solve it with the resources that we have. I don't think anybody has the answer. How you monetize it, that is, again, an, another question again. Um, with Google, we try and... We tend to try and get the services to work and to get them to work at scale first, and then we work out how to earn money from them afterwards. Okay, thank you. So uh, I think one, one last question, then we'll have to, uh, to finish up. Thank you. So just, just, uh, just the gentleman at the back, thank you for one last question. Oh, you don't, you don't want a question? Okay. Okay, sorry, just one more, thank you. Sorry. Yes, thank you. Uh, could you please give an example how and in what way uh, the recession has affected Google's operations? Um, yeah, I mean, a, a very uh, short, no, I mean, fair question, how it's, uh, how it's uh, affected Google's, Google's operations. We, um, you know, we had, we grew very, very quickly um, through 2006, 2007, 2007, 2008 in terms of headcount. We had a lot of people who were working for us who, uh, were on a, um, were on contracts, uh, were, um, weren't full-time Google employees. The, you know, uh, we, we did, we went through a phase, quite aggressive phase last year in reducing our headcount to, on the expectation that things were going to slow down. Um, we're now at the stage actually of starting to hire quite aggressively again. Um, our CEO in August talked about, uh, you know, he believes that the economy and Google, again, we've turned the corner. So like any other business, we, we look at our costs and we try and understand, uh, What's, what's going to happen in the future and when we respond accordingly. So, um, yeah, I mean, we, whether, whether it's the, uh, the phasing of investment or headcount within the business, or the typical type of things that any business would do, that's how we, have, that's how we respond. Okay, so I think we're time out, so thanks very much. Thank you.